Our next speaker is going to be Dr. Mickey Badia. He's um, a CRC in human stem cell biology. He's the director of the Stem Cell and Cancer Research Institute at McMaster University. Uh, his research is focused on defining the molecular mechanisms that regulate human stem cell development. And today he's going to present to us his work uh, entitled Programming Human Hematopoietic Development. Well, thanks uh, very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a great line of speakers, and it's a bit of a homecoming for me here, so it's a bit different than uh, uh, Derek and Cheryl. It was nice to see uh, Cheryl presenting your work. Uh, former postdoc of mine, Dave Hess, here, so it's, uh, it's great. So I thought I'd definitely talk a little bit about my uh, startings at the Robar. That's where I started my lab uh, as a professor here. And um, really, it was uh, written in blood, not by blood. Uh, written in blood. So I still focus quite a bit on the hematopoietic uh, system. And so for people that work in the hematopoietic system, they usually look at cytokines. We began looking at these funny molecules, went hedgehog notch, which now are sort of the usual suspects in stem cell biology. Most of these pathways are, are active. When we were bringing them close to hematopoiesis, people thought this was quite strange because they didn't match a cytokine or some CD marker. But it turns out they actually have important relevance. We, we knew from uh, a long while from the hematopoietic system that uh, the F word was very important, and that's functional assays. So PCRing for markers, looking at immunostochemistry, gave a lot of information in the early goings. However, at the end of the day, the cells had to function and, and assemble in an appropriate manner and behave and assemble with the other tissue that we were hoping to regenerate. And uh, there's no better system, I, in my view, than the hematopoietic system to demonstrate some of those paradigms. Uh, since leaving the Robarts uh, at McMaster, we now are focusing quite a bit on uh, acute myeloid leukemia and thinking about the parallels between how normal hematopoietic cells and uh, leukemic cells behave, uh, still keeping close to these types of pathways from the earlier work I did in my postdoc with John Dick. But uh, since then, in addition to ES cells, a lot has happened. I'm going to try to give a bit of a recap, maybe a little bit of history of uh, some of the area. Uh, it's a little bit old and new. Certainly the area of taking uh, skin fibroblasts and producing cells that at least seem at this point, although I think the jury's still out, uh, to be quite like embryonic stem cells. And there's a little bit of controversy, of course, in that area. But more importantly, differentiating either through uh, pluripotent cells, but more recently some work that we've done uh, doing what, what people have coined direct conversion, bypassing uh, this pluripotent state. So uh, this is the Stem Cell Institute. Uh, we've recruited about six people in total. We're looking at about three more to try to get a complement of about ten. Uh, it's on a virtual institute. It's all physically located in common space uh, in here. And um, it's quite interesting in that we are focused quite a bit on the human situation and certainly cell fate uh, orientation. So I kind of divided my talk into three parts. So one is, uh, like at the Robarts, and I know a lot of people here know me, uh, we had a lot of failures in, the, in experiments. Um, so I have new failures to tell you about now. I'm very proud. Um, and we're still on this silly thing, and uh, Bhagi Singh, one of my mentors, is still here. You know, and I, I remember talking to him about making, trying to make hematopoietic stem cells from ES. And he's looked at me, uh, okay, give that a try. Well, Bhagi, I'm still going at it. Um, I'll talk about some new opportunities and, and theme of your, of your evening uh, session, Back to the Future. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the changing fates of human cells and at least uh, a new proposal that we'd like to put forward on how this actually uh, comes to be. So this is my first love, uh, much as the Robarts is too, um, which is hematopoiesis. And, and again, I mentioned that the, the beauty of this system is that it's uh, defined in nice stepwise components. But more importantly, there's markers for each of the steps. So as the cells go from stem cells to mature cells, there are specific markers that delineate and demarcate exactly the stages that, you're, that you go in. But more importantly, there's also functional assays that distinguish between a stem cell fraction versus a progenitor that becomes more and more committed down the lineage. So it's a beautiful system to work with. So embryonic stem cells certainly came on the scene, and I think this has already been introduced quite nicely with, by uh, Cheryl. Um, certainly there's all sorts of ways and alchemy on how to grow, grow these cells, but essentially their important feature is truly their development of potential. Not the markers they express, but the fact that they can produce multiple cell types, representing all the germ layers, mesoderm, ectoderm, uh, and endoderm. There's obvious drawbacks, and of course, working in the human system as compared to the mouse, there's the ethical concerns, uh, immune rejection, limited resource. Here I refer to the actual blastocyst by one uh, would derive these cells. But the most key one that is uh, not talked about as much 
is how do you actually control differentiation, not support simultaneous differentiation, but control lineage induction uh, to a particular cell type that you want. So for our lab, uh, we're still very interested in multiple sources uh, of hematopoietic cells. You can get these from cord blood, adult bone marrow, mobilized peripheral blood. One of the basic problems when I started my lab and, and continues to be the case is that you can get massive proliferation from these putative hematopoietic cells. The problem is this comes at the expense of self renewal. So as the cells start to expand and grow into larger uh, translate amplifying cells, a lot of people are very encouraged that the growth factors is added, transcription factors added, we're expanding the population. But in fact, there was a, a concomitant reduction in the number of actual cells, stem cells, that could reconstitute the entire system. So we looked at alternatives, obviously, one being embryonic stem cells as an alternative source. And so the idea here was simple, right, that if you could grow in uh, lots of these cells, these embryonic stem cells in the pluripotent state, that one could try to control the differentiation as opposed to spontaneous differentiation. But our hopes were not to produce mature cells, but in fact see if we could produce hematopoietic stem cells from these ES cells. And that was the idea. So why do we think, and I'll address this to Bagi, why do we think actually we think this is really true? Well, so we do feel this is true because in the mouse system, one can take mouse embryonic stem cells. You can make an entire animal with those, with those uh, cells that are in a dish. So these are certainly not artifactual or odd in any way. These mice run around in a cage, but you can certainly grab the bone marrow, liver, or yolk sac and derive hematopoietic stem cells by functional definition, not by markers, can be transplanted into recipient mice and reconstitute the whole system. So that tells you that the potential to make an hematopoietic stem cell lies within these pluripotent cells. And so that's very encouraging. Obviously, uh, in the human, that's not possible. One cannot build chimeras and then uh, isolate hematopoietic cells. That's a limitation in the mouse, but certainly says the biology is there. So how do you then mimic this in vitro? And I won't go through all of the literature, but certainly there's been an incredible amount of work done for co-culturing cells. Well, I'll put them on stroma and the bone marrow, and that'll make hematopoietic stem cells. We'll do it with different types of stroma. And in the early days, about 12 years ago, they, they, a lot of people were doing just this, multiple strategies. Uh, I call it factorology, throwing different growth factors and different sequences and different combinations to try to encourage hematopoietic stem cell growth, and in some cases, transcription factor driven. So probably the best demonstration of that is a colleague of mine, George Daly, who's at Harvard, who uh, did an incredible experiment where they put in HOXB4. This is a homeobox gene conserved in the human and mouse. And what they essentially done was they induced this in embryoid bodies shown here. Uh, they knew that when they were induced, because they turned off GFP, they could dissociate these cells and then transplant them using a functional assay. So independent of the markers that might be expressed that were hematopoietic or transcripts, they had to actually prove they made hematopoietic cells by transplantation. And they transplanted them into lethally irradiated animals. And what they essentially found was that they could reconstitute the animal with the donor cells and then serially transplant that into secondary animals. Uh, that's not to scale those syringes, by the way. Um, and of course, they got engraftment. So that's my, uh, George said this is okay. I, I showed him this. He said it's a picture of him. He's very happy, and we were very happy to see this paper because it's, it was very encouraging that, in fact, one could use these paradigms uh, in vitro, not going through in vivo or in utero development, and still show that pluripotent cells have the capacity to make hematopoietic stem cells, which leads to our failures. Um, and if one does this with human cells, um, and I think Cheryl has shown nicely that, that some of the difficulties in, of growing these cells and, and working with these cells, you can dissociate these cells and transplant in multiple ways. You can do it by IV, intrafemoral. We've even thought that maybe earlier on in terms of getting an environment that was more conducive to the growth through intrahepatic injections. And in fact, you see no engraftment. When we, when we also attempted the experiment with Hox before, uh, this was done by retrovirus, lentivirus, tat fusions, uh, et cetera. We've done a lot, of, a lot of different ways to do this. Unfortunately, uh, we never saw any sizable engraftment. You definitely see what's called what I refer to as microchimerism, these small numbers of cells that sort of linger in there, but not, certainly not a robust reconstitution that one would see from bone marrow or cord blood. And in the end of the day, that's the gold standard. We have to compare what we're generating in a dish to what you can get from uh, somatic sources. So certainly with uh, um, a real game changer observation, I think, is in the area of, of, of what Shin Yamanaka had done first in the mouse and then later on by several other groups, including Jamie Thompson, uh, George Daly, and, uh, and himself in the, in the human. And what they essentially done, and most people have heard of this, is by taking skin biopsies, 
and isolating uh, patient-specific skin cells, they could then add uh, uh, factors. And there's the, the original factors are shown here, OX, SOX, CMIC, and KLF. This has been modified quite a bit. You can take away CMIC. Uh, timing of reprogramming takes place at different times. But essentially what to get out of this is that the essential factor that still remains is OX4. That is something that has not been able to be removed from the cocktail and remains as a, as a critical factor to get reprogramming. These cells through these arrows is showing, depicting a, a, a not very well understood mechanism by which cells which seem to be somatic uh, and fully differentiated now attain uh, an epigenome and behavior of an induced pluripotent cell. And, and the nice thing is there are markers. You can demarcate the numbers of cells in there using one marker called TRA160. And it's a very good surrogate, and I emphasize surrogate, that with a very high percentage, colonies that are TRA160 positive, in fact, give rise to cells that have multi-lineage potential. Uh, the benefits of this, of course, is that there were a few ethical issues associated with this, not having to use uh, blastocysts. Immune rejection, although there's a jury still out on this, there's a few people that are still saying that these might be uh, rejected. Uh, limited sources wasn't a problem, but the thing that's definitely common with embryonic stem cells is how do we control the differentiation? And that remains the commonality between human ES cells and IPS. So we have two pluripotent cells on the shelf, but we still have the same problems of how to differentiate them. So these gave us some new opportunities. And so this incredible feat, obviously, just to, for, to, to underscore, is that it allowed uh, or prevented the, the need for somatic cell nuclear transfer, because one could make these cells directly by reprogramming. Of course, the, the concept of personalized medicine, which I'm sure we'll hear about from our, uh, our Taylor Prize winner, uh, talking about disease modeling is incredibly important because you can get the specificity and the molecular heterogeneity from each of these patients captured in a dish by, dish by actually getting these IPS cells and certainly autologous transplantation. For a biologist like myself, however, this challenged some very important things, which is, well, what is cell fate? How does one actually shut the door and open the door on things? And, and are the, you really close the door forever? What is the permanence or what is the re reversibility of this process? So this is something that a lot of people, especially the hematopoietic system, hold dear. So this kind of rattled a lot of people, right? I mean, this, it made you, made you think about things differently. This is sort of the, you know, most card-carrying stem cells, I think, are, are supposed to have this in their back pocket, which is that these stem cells suffer new, give rise to trans amplifying progenitors, and then mature cells. I think this has been celebrated in the hematopoietic system and, and, more, and more recently uh, in, in neurogenesis as a sort of hierarchical organization of how these cells uh, move around. Some of this was, uh, was also, even before a molecular era, um, was brought up from Waddington in terms of a model system by which they felt that, it, that a cell maybe uh, at a pluripotent state was at the top of a, of a hill, and that the, the epigenome landscape then allowed it to uh, roll down the hill and then uh, eventually go to a lineage committed cell. So this is a concept that a lot of people hold on to as a way of understanding how cells make decisions, how they move from a stem cell to a committed cell. And so that's just really depicted here in cartoon form. Obviously, the concept of reprogramming starts to create new definitions. You know, you hear these things called trans-differentiation, de-differentiation, reprogramming, fake conversion. So, you know, what are all these things? Well, that's certainly the, the well-held way of thinking about these, stem cells to progenitors to mature cells. De-differentiation suggests this, and I'm just putting it in cartoon form to be more accurate on terms of what we're saying, is that a cell in a mature state that has, has its actual function for the tissue could then go back in the same pathway to progenitors to stem cells and de-differentiate. Of course, the jury's still out, and there's insufficient experiments to actually show that the pathway to go back is the exact same pathway to move forward. And the, some of the limitations are the, whether these cells regain the proliferative capacity and self renewal capacity of the stem cell that we think we're creating. Trans-differentiation also uh, as a word being thrown around quite a bit, but certainly says that it's important to know what your cell is turning into. But for, to associate it with trans differentiation, it's probably more important to know what you started off with. So the cell of origin is absolutely critical. So you start off with a large number of cells, not done clonally or at single cell level. It's difficult to know what actually the cell is turning into unless you can be specific about it. Now this foundation of reprogramming, just as a bit of a historical uh, side, was really established already in other systems. So before Shin Yanaka's uh, incredible experiments with reprogramming. There was certainly the concept was already out there, and this was done by Gurdon originally, uh, showing sexually mature xenopus could be uh, derived from a somatic cell nuclear transfer. And of course, uh, this is not a comprehensive list, but certainly the more popular ones is Ian Wilmot's work with cloning the sheep. Of course, later on, uh, fusion is another method uh, that suggested that if you took a mature cell 
You could fuse it with an embryonic cell. Obviously, the, uh, the ploidy was quite different. This was originally shown in the mouse in current biology in 2001, and then later on shown in science by a group at Harvard, uh, Chad Gowan's group, that uh, in 2005 showing this could also be done in the human. So the point of showing these experiments is simply that what it told us was there was something in the oocyte and the, and the ES cells, that uh, elements of it, that could simply reprogram a cell to a more primitive state. So, so what are those elements? And this was recently also done in, in the human, uh, making a tri uh, triploid cell um, uh, published in Nature. Some of these experiments with specific factors were already uh, done before. I'm just going to go through quickly some of the background before reprogramming in Chen Yamanaka's work was actually done. So this was done in 1987. And by taking uh, muscle cells and taking the proliferative and non-proliferative fractions, CD abstraction uh, was employed and MyoD1 was identified. By ectopically expressing MyoD1, a helix loop helix, and a transactivating main for CMYK in fibroblasts, the investigators were able to show they could generate myoblasts um, that were myosin positive. This, was, this paper was published uh, obviously long before, but it was uh, dismissed quite a bit for lack of reproducibility, and a few of the dogma makers didn't feel that this was something that was going to be uh, credible in, in terms of other tissue types. This is also shown inter, uh, interneural. So this is in 2002, well before Yamanaka's experiments. Glial cells using PAC6 could turn into neurons. Um, re more recent experiments by Doug Melton's group, and this was done in vivo, so I think this is important to, to delineate a little bit clearer, that the endocrine cells could then uh, be reprogrammed essentially in vivo by adenoviral delivery of nine transcription factors, which was then dwindled down to these three to generate beta cells that were insulin positive. And the fact that this worked in vivo is an interesting component because the adenovirus was actually able to infect all the cell types. The fact that it only converted the endocrine cells to beta cells suggests that the microenvironment or cues that are occurring are actually as critical as some of the drivers uh, of transcription that might be converting these cell fates. Intrahepatic fate was already shown by Tom, uh, Thomas Grass group, showing they could take B cells and by overexpressing EBP, uh, a leucine zipper, they could generate macrophage from these cells. But even earlier than that, in 2000, uh, Irv Weissman's group showed they could take lymphoid populations of cells shown here. And in contrast to using transcription factors, could actually use IL-2 and GCSSF receptor and generate myeloid cells, yet another demonstration of conversion. A lot of these things are generally not talked about uh, uh, because of the, uh, the ability to make IPS. More recently, a um, uh, 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 previous uh, a student of, uh, of our uh, Alan Taylor winners, <laughs> uh, Rudy Anish's group, showed that they could screen 15 factors for neural and epigenetic modifiers. Um, and certainly were able to show that these factors could take mouse skin cells and convert them into uh, neurons, uh, eye neurons, induced neurons. So this was certainly another demonstration of, of cell fate um, movement. This was also shown by Deepak Shervasti's group uh, at the Gladstone. They could take mouse cardiac fibroblasts. These are fibroblasts generated from the heart. Use these simple factors. They selected them based on their, on their uh, uh, role in, in mice and we're able to generate eye cardiomyocytes, okay? In both cases, these are unilineage and mature cells, and this is more recent work. So we've been working a little bit on, on this idea in the meantime in terms of changing fate, but of course we were interested in human cells. So one of the things that we started thinking about was the conversion process. And there's no question that we know we're starting off with these fibroblasts, these changes occur, and there were markers that delineated whether you get these IPS colonies these colonies that are reminiscent of highly compact cells that look much like ES cells. We started to think about what was happening in between, and there are many people that have already observed that there's a lot of cell types during the, during the changes that take place that change their morphology along the way. And so we asked a simple question, are these stable populations, is this based on transcription factor stoichiometry, what are these cell populations that are emerging? What we found was, um, is that in addition to the putative IPS cells uh, that could later on to be shown to be uh, uh, fully reprogrammed cells that are trial 160 positive. We also found the nematopoietic marker, CD45, this marker is only expressed on nematopoietic cells, amongst the culture. We isolated to the two populations, and this whole experiment was done by reprogramming with these factors. And essentially what we did was we just PCR'd from the different populations and found that there was an incredible level of OC4 expression in the cells that were restricted to CD45 expression, but did not show TRA160 expression. So this observation suggested that in a more uh, clinical way, we could actually just go back and take fibroblasts, 
and express uh, each of these factors alone, and we've done other ones, to show that, uh, in fact, that the colonies that we see that are these odd-looking colonies that don't look like the IPS colonies uh, were, in fact, only emerged in the presence of OCK4 expression alone. When we compared those cells and isolated them, we found that if we added growth factors such as FLT3 and stem cell factor, we could, in fact, uh, see an increase in the number of colonies. We think this is simply a survival effect, but the induction effect is really limited to OCK4 uh, alone. One can do affymetrics array and just sort of compare these cells. And essentially, this is just to show that they, they certainly are not fibroblasts anymore. These CD45 expressing ones are very different than fibroblasts. But they actually cluster quite a bit to more mature uh, hematopoietic cells, such as those mononuclear cells from umbilical cord blood in the human. We wanted to then make sure that we weren't differentiating a, uh, an IPS cell, a pluripotent cell, only to re-differentiate it back to blood, and we were just fooling ourselves with timing. And essentially what we are showing here is that two markers, TRA160 and SSA3, if you follow um, cells, fibroblasts containing just OCK4 or the growth factors, you see that you never see these markers turn on over a time frame uh, of 31 days, whereas in the IPS where they receive all of the reprogramming factors, the Yamanaka factors, you see these markers go up. So that was phenotypic evidence that we weren't uh, seeing a rare population of pluripotent cells in the dish. By gene expression array, that was confirmed. It was really clustering away. We weren't seeing that. But more importantly, you getting back to the F word, we have to use functional assays and make sure that fibroblasts expressing OCK4 did not give rise to teratomas. And this, is, you can see, just background um, uh, tissue and IPS forming ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. So we're fairly confident we we're bypassing this phase. You could break down the process when we added OCK4 into three areas. One was the fibroblast to begin with, and this is just relative gene expression. In red is shown some of the transcription factors known to be critical for early hematopoiesis. What we find is when the cells begin to express CD45, those genes elevate, but genes associated with mesoderm, such as brachyuri, did not go up, suggesting these cells weren't going through a mesodermal transition to then arrive at hematopoiesis, much like an ES cell or pluripotent cell would. When cytokines were added, and only when cytokines were added, we see a drop in OCK4 expression and a, and a continued expression of the hematopoietic genes. We now have some more recent data from the lab is that if, if these OCK4 is maintained at a high level, you can actually, uh, it actually inhibits terminal differentiation toward the hematopoietic lineages. We're able to take these fibroblasts, uh, generate these 45 cells, and this is just a, a quick summary showing you that we can generate granulocytes, erythroid cells, mixed lineage progenitors, uh, megakaryocytes, and monocytes that looked fairly reminiscent of cells you'd see from umbilical cord blood. The cells had phagocytic uh, capacity, they could engulf beads, um, they showed morphology of the xenophils, basophils, and neutrophils. Most importantly, and something we haven't been able to achieve using human ES cells or human IPS when we differentiate them to blood, they seem to have maintained an embryonic signature, meaning they don't express protein levels of beta globin, the adult globin. What we found in the case of uh, what we're terming direct conversion, bypassing IPS cells, uh, IPS state, was that we had beta globin expression at the protein level. And I emphasize protein because gene expression definitely is seen in ES cells and IPS, but protein is something that we've never seen nor has been reported to date. So we think this might be reminiscent of the fact that you're bypassing the pluripotent state altogether and you're getting an adult phase. When transplanted into mice, in contrast to the earlier failures of xenografts, we do see some level of engraftment. Oh, that's a Mac to PC issue. So these dots represent uh, mice uh, of a human chimerism. Again, the levels were getting a little bit higher, but more importantly, beyond microchimerism levels, which we'd shut off at around this dash line, which is really below this is what we get from ES and IPS, that you could actually isolate cells from these uh, mice and generate progenitors out of the animals, suggesting that they were sustaining some level of primitive uh, self-renewal occurring in the animal. So this was important because it's, uh, it really separated the use of ES cells or IPS, and we could achieve something in vivo we weren't able to before. So where are we going with this now? Well, we're trying to uh, focus on, on the fact that we are getting progenitors of a given lineage. And that's a benefit because it gives you this ability to then expand those resulting progenitors without worrying about constantly chasing terminal differentiation in, into mature cell types. We think this is important because since the neuronal work was, was done, there's been a, a whole group uh, using these factors and now showing the human that neuro-D is required. Uh, it's from the same group, from Marius's group. Um, microRNA expression together with neuro-D was sufficient uh, to get uh, uh, an induced neuron. Uh, 
other, other patient samples from Alzheimer's and Parkinson fibroblasts with a variety of different um, milieu of factors were allowed to get uh, neurons. And the point behind this is to show that microRNAs uh, being potentially easier to transfect into the cells uh, is interesting, but also shows you that there seems to be several ways to skin the cat, that there's not just one, uh, one trick in order to get these cells to turn into neurons, but there's, there are different recipes of transcription factors that have been very rapidly generated. You can see all of these papers uh, in, the, in the last year. We took a more progenitor type view on this, looking at the human. And so this is some work that's not been published, and this is some early observations that, in fact, using the same factor, OCK4, used in reprogramming, and to help us generate hematopoietic cells, that we're able to generate uh, sphere-like, and I'm saying that for Derek, uh, sphere-like uh, neurospheres um, from these cultures uh, un under the right conditions. One could use in a, in a recipe book borrowed from people that have already been doing neural differentiation to show that these neurospheres are uh, multipotent in nature in terms of generating astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and neurons. And this is just uh, the, the kinds of experiments that we've done, take starting off with these neurospheres and culture them at different time points in different conditions. Essentially, you can get cells of atrocytic lineage, oligodendrocytes, and neurons expressing markers associated with those lineages and morphology. They seem to be uh, functional, the appropriate, although difficult to do patch clamping on these cells. Um, you can see that in elevated uh, vo uh, voltages, that you get an action, action potential propagation. And of course, by inhibiting the site one of the sodium chloride uh, channel receptor, you can uh, inhibit that uh, action potential, suggesting that it seems to be some uh, reminiscent uh, or important electrophysiology in these cells. So at McMaster, we're very interested in sort of working on the human um, and, and, and moving these into potential applications. Um, one of, the, one of the, the benefits, I think, of this method is that you have progenitors, so you have the ability to potentially expand these cells that you derive from the skin. And we are looking at other sources. We hear that adipocytes are very abundant uh, in a lot of places, uh, potentially even better than fibroblasts. And we're asking whether those cells can also be converted, uh, potentially with more ease to take up these factors to generate more of the cell types we want, specifically progenitors. We're also looking at drug screening these cells because we can capture uh, cells from patients. So we have a drug screening platform where we're looking more specifically at the types of pathways and genetics in these patients and seeing whether we can capture those mature cells by using either IPS or more importantly direct conversion, which prevents you from having to pluck the cells and isolate to show you have fully differentiated cells. So there's a, there's a speed issue that definitely comes along with the conversion process uh, with patients specific samples. Um, instead of looking sort of more into the, to the mouse system, we've also started to work in a collaboration uh, with a group at the NIH doing very similar work for hematopoietic and, and hopefully uh, very soon neural, uh, starting off with rhesus macaque uh, cells. The benefit there, obviously, is that from a transplantation point of view, one would not be limited by a xenograft, human into mouse, but in fact would be able to do it in the, uh, in, in the primate model, and we have very encouraging data. And this collaboration is with uh, Cynthia Dunbar. That's not Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia Dunbar. Um, and there, I, I promised I'd tell her I would do that. Um, so we also have a, a proposal of a, a potential other way of thinking about how the reprogramming could take place. And so when we use the term fibroblast, it's very undescript. Um, there aren't a lot of lineage trace markers that would definitively say what a fibroblast is or, or isn't. And so very early goings, and this is just snippets of data that we have, but I wanted to share to, be, to, to bring up a proposal at the end of, of a way of thinking about reprogramming. Uh, so using these vectors that were given to us by James Ellis uh, in Toronto um, that report um, uh, essentially these are the uh, repeats, three repeats for OCT uh, um, enhancer promoter regions uh, hooked up to GFP, one could put these into human ES cells and of course see the GFP light up because these cells are pluripotent and based on the expression of OCT4. Uh, control vector of course sees nothing. What we found in contrast to some earlier work that James has done, in fact, that if you take adult fibroblasts, we've done this also from cardiac uh, and lung-derived fibroblasts, so it's not restricted to epidermal uh, sources, that in fact there's a small population of cells that actually is GFP positive. The obvious conclusion is it's leaky vector or incorrect expression. But in fact, when we look at these cells, because you can isolate them based on GFP, you actually find if you compare them to human ES cells, and this is just immunous to chemical staining for OCT4, that in fact they express low levels of OCT4. Um, by not isolating these cells and looking strictly at OCT4 immunochemistry, you wouldn't be able to see these cells because number one, they're incredibly rare and the levels are extremely low. We did gene expression analysis on them. We find that these cells, which we call EOS expressing, uh, 
This is the name of the vector. Uh, what we find is, in fact, they cluster away from normal fibroblasts based on gene expression. So they don't seem to be like the bulk pop population of fibroblasts, and they're very different. But getting back to our mantra of the uh, functional assays, given the fact that we can get cells that ex fibroblasts that express uh, this, ve this vector uh, versus cells that do not express the vector, you can do a simple experiment, which is to ask which ones we program. And in our hands, at least, over multiple uh, um, sources of cells, we find that by adding the Yamanaka factors, that only the population that initially expressed low levels of this, vec of this vector, an OC4, are the ones that participate in IPS generation, whereas we never saw IPS generation from the other populations. Of course, this doesn't mean that these cells can't reprogram under various conditions. It simply means that these cells seem, seem to have some benefit or predisposition toward pluripotency uh, attainment. More importantly, when uh, looking at hematopoietic fate, as I said, we only used OC4 in those cases. So again, we repeated the experiments with these uh, low-level uh, expressing EOS cells versus the negative. When we add OC4, we find that we do not, again, see pluripotent cells, at least measured by this marker. But we do see the CD45 cells only coming from that resident population, suggesting in addition to IPS formation, but also for direct conversion to blood, that there is a resident population there that might be responsible. So we put forth this proposal that, in fact, it, the all non all fibroblasts are made equally, that, in fact, there might be deterministic participation. Again, that doesn't mean that the other cells under other conditions, such as inductive conditions adding CMIC or KLF or other oncogenes, could not participate in reprogramming. But certainly, there seems to be a front-runner population that is participating when we uh, in, transduce with OC4. What we think we're actually doing, as opposed to more the concept of direct conversion, as we're creating a plastic state. We think that there's a, a, a potentially not metastable but plastic population that is derived from this population and that if you put it under the appropriate conducive conditions, for example, adding SOX or NANOM, one would derive IPS cells, whereas if you put it under hematopoietic cytokines, you would, add, you would find hematopoietic tissue. Uh, neural conditions, as we've done, we see neural cells or neurospheres. And certainly, we're now looking at other lineages, and we have evidence now emerging that we can also get other lineages by only using OC4 as a driver. So we think this might be a way of sort of unifying the view. And so where would we put this in terms of Waddington's Canal? Well, certainly, the idea of cells rolling down and following a landscape towards lineage commitment. Uh, Yamanaka's experiments and others have shown that you can sort of reverse this process and sort of go back up the hill we would suggest that in addition to that, there might be cells sort of stuck on a cliff of this hill, specifically cells that may have been predisposed or plastic in their cell fate that might be participating more readily, uh, being further up the hill, be, they can participate more readily in generating pluripotent cells, but also because of the nature of their plastic state from the top of this, uh, this canal, could also participate in lineage commitment to at least neural and hematopoietic in our hands. So that's uh, just a proposal of thinking about uh, reprogramming in a slightly different way. And I'll end um, by certainly thanking all the people in my lab. And I've very, been very lucky at McMaster. I've had a talented group of people. Um, Shervanti is setting up her own lab now that's, that just left. Uh, but lots of groups here, including Eva, who did the original work with the hematopoietic cells. Uh, Ryan, who's continuing to feverishly work on this, uh, the idea of a plastic cell being generated. And for those that uh, remember Don Lilly, that was here at the, at the Robarts, I thought I'd embarrass her, and it's her 50th birthday today, so uh, happy birthday, Don. So thanks a lot. Okay, so for the question period, we're going to have the uh, speaker actually repeat the question for the online stream. So, uh, Frida. Those mesenchymal cells, which came from, are definitively mesenchymal, not normal. 
or genetic manipulation, just the selective culture conditions, that that would really be preferable? Or do you think you need to have those genes expressed? I am not going to repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think about how to Actually, I want to see if she can repeat that. <laughs> okay, so if I, if I can summarize the question, I think it would, the, the, the concept was other people are starting to show, and, and certainly uh, we're, we're collaborating a little bit with Frida on this also, uh, that other populations have this, for, yes, for lack of another dirty word, plastic. Just, you know, have to, you know, if someone will come up, I'm sure, with another term and we'll all celebrate. But for now, let's just call it that. Um, it, are, are, there other, are there other ways to then get other lineages where you don't need the transcription factors? I think some of the early work from Irv Weissman's uh, uh, group where they were putting in the uh, interleukin-2 receptor and et cetera to get uh, changes uh, suggest that certainly signaling pathways I think are key. And uh, you know, how do that environment regulates it? Um, whether the transcription factors are limited in terms of their span, I think the proposal we're trying to say is that you can almost generate uh, all the cells that would define a pluripotent cell in a way uh, by driving. So we know that certainly for the neural lineage um, that we think that the cells definitely produce these mature cells but honestly in very few numbers very far between and this is a, an incredible selective process. So I, I think these transcription factors are, are, are likely going to be key maybe coupled to the right conditions but I guess if a cell is changing fate and you don't put in the right conditions for that fate to survive uh, I, I sort of view the transcription factors and the culture additions hand in hand uh, I don't know how a, a, a transcription factor will work in a completely cell autonomous fashion and be completely inert, other than Derek's default neural cells, to be inert to its environment. Um, so I, I would think they're, they're going to be hand in hand, but there's lots of groups that have incredible amount of data uh, suggesting these populations exist in multiple tissues. Whether, to what degree that's alchemy of the culture condition, um, I think that it, 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 it's going to be some hard experiments that have to be done clonally, right? Because I think that speaks to the, the whole point. What cell did you start with? And that's the heavy lifting that's difficult.